In this video, I'm going over our practice problems, um, going back to our radical functions. So in these first three questions, this is going back to our transformation. So here you just have to remember um, that if I'm shifting three to the left, then because this is a horizontal, this is what's gonna go inside of the radical. But I do notice that they all have X plus three because remember, right, this is always what's inside is opposite. So they all show left three. Then we have a vertical, which is outside. So I need outside the radical vertical compression by one fourth, which remember anything outside with that vertical is going to stay. So that means, well, I can mark off A because it's inside, which is a horizontal. Again, B still inside. Now notice here we go. So here's our vertical of one fourth, then here's a vertical stretch of four. So that means that's why here the answer was B, a C, sorry. Now in question number two, which shows a reflection over the Y axis. So that's when you have a negative inside of the radical. So I'm gonna go ahead and mark off B because that's a reflection over the X. Then you have the horizontal. So now that's inside stretch by five. So if it's inside, remember guys, inside is opposite. So I don't want five, but I need one fifth because remember this factor of one fifth represents that stretch of five. So I'm gonna mark off A. And here we need two units up, which is outside. That's why the answer was B, not C. Because C represents two to the left. Now in question three, which of these um, represents our transformations here? So again, negative on the outside is now a reflection over the x-axis, which so far so good. Here now inside, you have horizontal. But this is a factor of one third. So a horizontal compression or shrink by factor of one third. Because remember again, right? Anything inside is opposite. But because it's a horizontal shrink by one third, that's why the answer is B. Then notice here too, how we've got that plus four on the out, which represents four units up. So it does match that the answer was D. Then four A. Now notice here, again, when we're subtracting, um, I'm sorry, when we're dividing, we need to subtract, but we have two square roots. So remember that index here of two. So really that's, 12 over two over, and then four over two. Now we can subtract, which is B to the eight over two, and then eight divided by two, which is four. So that's why the answer was A. Now for B, notice how we're, mul we're multiplying, so we need to add the exponents. But again, because they're square roots, we do have that index of two here. So that is, 15 over 2 and 13 over 2, which adding those exponents together, now we've got 28 over 2. Now I can divide that, so the final answer is c to the 14th power. Then here in 5a, notice how here we're given this information, f is less than 0, which shows here that it's negative and g is positive. Which of these expressions is equivalent? Well, first off, I notice that this negative here is on the outside, like it's a negative one. So that means I need a negative on the outside for my answer. So I'm gonna mark off A and B, because here's that negative value. Then notice how we have that fraction. So now you just have to remember, if I have the fraction, what does this represent? Always go to, that is F to the sixth, power. So that's f to the sixth inside of that g radical. That's why the answer was d. Then here in 5b, notice how this is not like a negative one because this is the value negative a. So now here I've got to keep this all together. So again, I have a negative exponent. So this is one over. Then here again, keep it all together, that negative a then to the C over five. 
Now we can rewrite this as our radical. So one over the square root, so or not square root, sorry, because um, inside of this radical, we have that negative a value here. So negative a to the c inside of that fifth root. Then 5c. So now notice here, if f is positive, right? So we're, again, figuring out that equivalent expression. So again, we know we have that negative exponent, but f is positive, not negative. So I'm going to mark off a and b. I mean, sorry about that. We realized the typo. One of them was supposed to be to the c power. but So if you notice, that is f to the b. And again, always remember, right, that um, bottom, that denominator is always the index. So that's why here this is represented by C or, you know, in this case, it could have been D. Sorry about that. So this was supposed to be, you know, with the C and B here. Now question number six and seven, we're looking for which statement is false. So make sure you look through. I notice I'm talking about the attributes of this graph here. I'm going to go ahead and identify. So my um, point here is at 2, 1. Here's my x and here's my y value. Then notice our graph going in this direction. So here I notice a couple of situations where I'm talking about domain, I'm talking about end behavior and the interval. So I'll go through and let's do the domain, right? So main domain is your x's. So here domain is as x's and starting at the value of 2. Then notice, remember, x's, we're talking about going to the left and to the right. Well, notice the graph is going to the right towards positive. So this is x is greater than or equal to 2. So now, if this is positive or greater than, that's the same as also going towards positive infinity because you're going greater than. So this statement is true because this does represent a greater than or equal to value. So now let's check our n behavior. Now, remember, n behavior, we are always focusing on the y value. So remember, f of x is the same as y. So here we go. As x's are approaching infinity, so as we're going to the right, right, towards positive infinity, we'll notice this right side of the graph. What is it doing? Well, it's going down to negative infinity. So here, this statement is true. So now let's go to the next direction. As x approaches negative infinity, so now reading it to the left, right, boom. Remember, we're going to the left now towards negative infinity, but it's not going all the way, right? It's stopping at what y value? 1. Notice it said 2, which is the x value. So this is the statement that was false. And then, of course, to see why a is true, notice how here you are decreasing because read it left to right. So our function is decreasing those values. Starting at the x value, remember interval is x value, so starting at 2, and again going on to infinity. Then here, which statement again is false. So now here, this is a cubed root function. Remember, cubed root functions, the domain and range, because we're going in all directions here, nonstop, right? This is all reals. And another way of showing all reals is negative infinity to infinity. So A is true about the range. So now let's take a look at the N behavior. So here as X's approach infinity as we're going to the right towards positive infinity, we'll notice what direction is the right side of our graph going. Well, it's going down into all of our negative infinity values. So this statement matches, which is also true. And as x approaches, negative infinity. So now as we're going to the left, right, towards negative infinity, we'll notice what direction is our graph going. It's going up to positive infinity. Notice it says negative. So that was the false statement. So again here, notice how the interval of decrease, so again reading it left to right, notice how we're constantly going down decreasing, and it's a non-stop. So it is, again, over all reals or negative infinity to infinity. So that statement is true. Now, number eight, practicing rewriting. And we're going to write this as an exponential. So first, I need to rewrite what's in the numerator. 
So this is b to the, well again, b to the fifth, so b to the fifth. But inside of that fourth root, a radical of four. Then times, so here I've got b to the 10 over four, because that's b to the 10, right? Then notice, I'm going to still go ahead and just rewrite this. So that's all we did here. So I'll rewrite this, my denominator. So now notice in the numerator, because we're multiplying, we need to add the exponent. So this is now 15 over 4, b to the 15th over 4. Then notice in the denominator, we are multiplying. So with parentheses, we're multiplying. So 7 times 3 fourths is, so 7 times 3 fourths. That will give you now a new exponent of 21 over 4. So now notice the last step. What do we have to do here with division? Subtract the exponent. So here you've got top to bottom, right? So 15 fourths minus 21 fourths, which gives you b to the negative 6 or 1 over b to the 6 fourths here. Now in question number 9, notice how here we are solving for x. Think about this parentheses though, guys, like this is a radical. See how this is 1 to the third, or to the one third power? So this is the same as 8 times the cubed root of x minus 15. This is all the same. So notice how I'm not going to distribute an 8, right? Because we got to get the radical by itself. Same here, right? we got to get the parentheses by itself. So if it's being multiplied by 8, we need to divide both sides of the equation by 8. Now I've got x minus 15 to the 1 third power, which is equal to 3. Now that this is by itself, right, like our radical, we can raise both sides, but to the now third power, right? Because that's the reciprocal, opposite of one third. So now the exponents will cancel out, inverse operation. X minus 15 is now equal to three to the third power, which is 27. So now to solve for X, last step, go ahead and you would add 15 here to both sides. And that's how you get X is equal to 42 from 27 plus 15. So now question number 10. Notice how we have our two cubed root functions. So option one is you could graph this in Desmos. So remember in Desmos, right, you always graphed, graph the left side of the equation, but see how this is just a number. So if you put zero on the um, next line, it's not going to give you anything. So you do have to make sure to type in y equals zero to see where they cross. I'm going to go ahead now, though, and show algebraically. Well, first off, we can't do anything because notice how both of those cubed roots are on the same side. So we need to move this one over and add the cubed root here to both sides of the equation. So that cubed root being added to both sides, right, we're moving it over, now cancels out. So we've got the cubed root of 4x plus 11 is equal to the cubed root of 8x plus 17. Now we can go through and start solving. Well, if I've got the cubed root, I can raise both sides to the third power. And notice how by doing that, they both cubed roots cancel each other out. So now I've got 4x plus 11 is equal to 8x plus 17. And now notice we're solving a multi-step equation. I need to gather my variable, so I'm going to subtract 4x. You'll get the same answer if you subtracted 8x from both sides. And 11 is now equal to 4x plus 17. And now you're just solving a two-step. So I'm going to subtract 17 here from both sides. And 4x is equal to negative 6. Divide by 4. And notice how we've got here negative 6 over 4, which simplifies to negative 3 over 2, which is why the answer was D. Then here, number 11. Notice how we have two different bases, so we can't add the exponents in the numerator. Notice in the numerator, denominator, the bases are the same, so we're going to subtract. Remember, right? So top to bottom. So for that base of 8, we've got 6 fourths minus 7 fourths, which now gives us an exponent of 8 to the negative 1 fourth. 
Then here again, we've got 2 minus negative 3. Watch your signs here, right? Because now 2 negatives making a positive. So this base of 5 now has an exponent of 5. But now notice we can't leave this as is because notice how the base of 8 has a negative exponent, which means we're going to get a fraction answer. So I'm going to mark off A. And because of the negative exponent, that's why our base here of 8 needs to go in the denominator, leaving 5 to the fifth power in the numerator. That's why the answer was C. Then question number 12. So here we're talking about this application problem about nurses um, tracking the health, um, height and weight of infants, and we're using this function here. So the average height modeled by this. So notice how our h or h of a is representing the height. And as you keep reading, a is representing what? The age of the girl in months. So we are asked to estimate what is the age of the girl. So we're looking for the age. That's our question. When the height is 30, so h is equal to 30. So now you got to make sure to plug in. So notice how 30, if the 30 inches represents the height, we're not going to put that inside the radical because that's your A. So this is 30 is equal to 3 times that radical A plus 19. And now we're going to solve for that square root of A here. And so here, first off, we got to get the radical by itself, right? but it's being multiplied by three and we're adding 19 to it. So treat it like a two-step, always add or subtract first. So we're gonna subtract the 19 from both sides. Now I've got 11 is equal to three times that radical A. Now I can go through, if we're multiplying that radical by three, divide by three. Now here um, I notice that I'm gonna end up with like a decimal. So I'm gonna leave the fraction 11 over 3 or 11 thirds. It's still equal to that radical A. So now, what is that last step here to solving for A? Well, if it's in the square root, we need to go ahead and square both sides. So the radical cancels out, and you've got 11 thirds being raised to that second power, which gives you approximately 13.4. So that's why the answer here is D. Now in question 13, again, you're solving for X, now, notice here again, if you're still not unsure about the solving, make sure you can graph this, right? So here you would graph the left side and then graph the right side, right? And see where the two um, graphs intersect each other, where the two functions cross. Let's go ahead, though, and solve this algebraically. Well, if the radical is already by itself, I'm going to go ahead and square both sides. So now here I cancel out and I've got... 42 plus x is now equal to x squared. Now notice because you're solving a quadratic, quadratics always have to equal zero. So that's why we're gonna subtract x from both sides and subtract 42. So now here you've got zero is equal to, bring down that x squared, but now minus x minus 42. Now we can go through and start factoring, solving by factoring. So here, what numbers are going to multiply to get 42, or in this case, negative 42, right? And add to get negative 1. Well, thinking of factors of 42, I could use 21 and 2, but those are too far spread apart. They're never going to add or subtract to get me that 1 or negative 1, but 7 and 6. So if I'm going to use 7 and 6, then which value needs to be negative to get negative 1? Negative 7. So this is negative 7 and positive 6, which means x is equal to 7 and negative 6. But remember, always now with this quadratic here, you check for extraneous solutions. Always go back and check. So I'm going to rewrite the original equation, so we've got our work there. And then notice how we just have x here. Remember, we're going to focus on positive values of the radical to checking for extraneous. So can x be positive 7? Can the radical equal a positive 7? Yes. But can this radical equal negative 6? No. So that's why negative 6 is extraneous and only x is equal to 7. 
now in question 14. Notice how here, guys, we've got this cubed root function, and so which equation represents the graph? So here, you got to make sure to use Desmos. I would use Desmos um, to graph this. So um, here, now, we could always kind of look through and see. But let's use Desmos to check and make sure and compare. And so in question number 14, there are actually um, two answers to this one as well. So if you notice, I'm going to go ahead and just graph this and take a look at the window. So like I'm going to notice a couple of points here. So like for example, I notice that here I've got the point. So I'm going to look for the point. So that is 0, negative 3. I also see how I'm kind of going through here at 1, negative 2. So notice how there's kind of these points here on the graph that you can use that to kind of check here um, and compare as you're graphing. So looking at the graph, so I'm going to try and um, get this here. So notice how I've kind of got all these graphs, so A, B, and C. And then notice if you ever need to zoom out or zoom in if you ever need to, right? So I'm looking at this graph here. Remember, right, we've got the 0, negative 3, and 1, negative 2. Well, boom. Notice how here there's my 0, negative 3. I even have 1, negative 2. Two here sorry there you go so 1 negative 2 so notice how a is one of the graphs that matches so we do have a here as one of our graphs now there is actually another graph. so I'm gonna go through and let's check this one Oop, notice how we got flipped right so this one does not match what we have here with our graph so I'm now gonna go to C same thing. Notice how here it got reflected, it got flipped, so it does not match. And then let's go to D. Notice how even with those negatives, that's why I always check. Notice how here you do end up with the same graph. So I could zoom in and here you go. So again, notice how there's that negative three zero going through also one. So we can make these comparisons and check and notice how we have those same points as like we had here. So that's why for this one, the answer was both A and B. And so now here for our next question, so number 15. Notice how this graph, and just to kind of clarify, you're given the function here. So this is a radical function starting here at like 0, 0, going on and on because this radical is going on. Now, but keep in mind what this represents. D is representing the diagonal in inches. So notice how this is your Y, right? So this is my Y axis, and my area of the, di um, the, area of the um, screen here is your X axis. So here also, just to kind of keep in mind, the curved line is what we're looking at. So this is the function. This red line here, sorry guys, that's just kind of to help you read and if people ever wanted to understand how to read this graph here. Um, but if we're looking at the curved line, so going on and on and on technically, according to this situation, could you have, and if we're talking about the domain, which is technically zero, to infinity because it's going on and on and on starting at zero or x value is going to infinity could you have an infinite size of an area of a screen or diagonal no so notice how that's why the graph here is stopping at that value of 200 so i'm gonna um cross out b and b then what does the domain represent well remember domain is the x values so what are the X values. Well, if X is represented by the area, that's why the answer is A, because the diagonal is your Y, which is your range. So question 16 is also like that one, but now you have to understand here with this graph, we're talking about the height of a helium balloon. So we're talking about the height of the helium balloon over time and hours and is represented by our function. 
So keep in mind, think about a balloon, right? Think about this like in terms of like the situation, if we're trying to figure out what the domain is and what it represents. Well, if you think about it, this is the ground, right? Could a balloon go past the ground? Well, no. So technically, we're really going to, even though the graph goes on because the function could go on, because of the actual application of this problem, the balloon is going to hit the ground here at nine zero, where the X value is nine. So the domain is not zero to infinity for this application of this problem. It's from zero to nine. So now we have to decide, okay, well, what represents the domain? Well, we don't have that um, uh, labels here like what we did in the previous problem. So now go back to the function. Here, keep in mind that this was always your H of T in this case is always the Y or the output. That means here in our equation, this was always the X values or the input. So if we are putting in the X values, which is T for time, and also remember guys, time is always gonna be on that X axis truly. If you remember this from other application, like in science as well, because um, time is independent, that means here your domain is your time, that is your X's, that is your input, domain being your X, that's why the answer was B. So again, time is representing your domain, the X's, the input. So now question 17. This is review, guys, with rational expression. Notice how we are simplifying. So here I've got um, to make sure when simplifying, to always factor and then we cancel. So remember, when simplifying, factor and cancel. Well, I notice here, that's just the two terms of binomial, but there's a GCF of five. So if I divide both terms by five, factoring that out, you end up with X plus six. So this is five times x plus six. Now here, notice how we do have a quadratic. So we do have to factor that where what numbers, what values multiply to get 64 and add to get 10. We'll focus on factors of 24. Well, not eight and three, right? Because that adds to get you 11, but six and four. So now notice we can simplify, right? Because what cancels out? What's a common factor? x plus six. So simplified, you have five over x plus four. And then this is review on guys solving our equation. Now remember with fractions, we also had extraneous solutions. Remember you can never divide by zero because it makes a fraction undefined, which means here x plus two cannot equal zero. So that means x cannot equal negative two, or if I've got x plus three here, x cannot equal negative three. So those are the two extraneous, so keep that in mind. Always identifying those extraneous, just like with our radicals. So now I'm gonna go through, and let's see here. Well, I notice I've got x plus two and x plus three here. We're adding and setting equal to this rational expression here. Well, I notice I have a trinomial. Well, I could factor this trinomial. What two factors multiply to get six and add to get five? Well, three and two. So notice how these are the two factors here, which means this already has the two factors. So what is this first fraction or rational expression missing? Well, if it already has x plus two, then that means I need to multiply it by x plus three. And what we do to the top, we do to the bottom here. Then here, that means with our second rational, if we already have x plus three, that means we need to multiply by what's the missing factor? x plus two. We're gonna multiply numerator and denominator by x plus two. Now notice we need to distribute that value of eight. So eight x plus 24, then plus distributing four here, four x plus eight is equal to still seven x minus 16. Because now notice, right, everything has a common denominator. So I'm now just gonna focus on the numerator. Well, I notice I've got a bunch of like terms here to combine. So 8x plus 4x is 12x. Then 24 plus 8 is 
2, which is equal to 7x minus 6. Now I'm going to go through and solve for x continuing on. So I'm going to subtract 7x from both sides. You could subtract 12x as well and you'll get the same answer. 5x plus 32 is equal to negative 6. Now we're solving for x. Subtract 32 and you get 5x is equal to negative 38. So now notice last step here, divide by 5, and x is equal to negative 38 over 5, which is clearly not one of our extraneous, so it is our solution.